I got thrust into essentially redneck central of what hunting was and given a lawn chair and given a gun and said, if something walks by, shoot it. There was something missing. Why is nobody talking about why they hunt? It was almost like we had forgotten how to be storytellers. The kill component of that hunting is just a mere fraction of what the purpose of why we go there essentially is for. Every story becomes a part of my family, becomes a part of our family, becomes invested in what we're doing. I think the more that that message can get out there, and the more like the hunting lifestyle is going to be around for my kids and my grandkids one day. This is Robbie Kroger with the Blood Origins Project, and I am on the Wild Initiative. Put down your latte and pull on your boots. There's a lot of people that can pull the trigger on an animal, but they don't know what to do with it after. If you would have told me that a stupid turkey was going to make me get that excited, I would have told you you were crazy. It's just a skill that you have to perfect over a lot of years. Hunting is a tribal activity. We have lost the tribe. We can't even hunt together anymore. Well, the people that are anti-hunting are usually pro-abortion. So kill the people, save the animals. I just remember riding my horse back to camp with the northern lights and the moose behind me, and I'm like, this is why I've done this. This is as cool as an experience as I will get. Hi, this is Jim Shockey. This is Sam Sohol, the public land bus guy. Hi, I'm Kimmy Greentree. Hi, this is South Cox with the Western Bowhunter Podcast. Hey, this is Ben Dedamonte, a.k.a. Shed Crazy. You're listening to The Wild Initiative. Hey, y'all, welcome to another episode of The Wild Initiative. Today, I am sitting down with Robbie Kroger of The Blood Origins Project. Robbie, thanks so much for uh, taking the time to sit down with me. I appreciate you, Sam, and uh, welcome to, as I understand it, the hunting tribe and hunting community. Thank you very much, man. Uh, it's, uh, it's been quite a journey, quite an interesting trip, but uh, there's nothing I love more in this world right now. So, But to start out, uh, I would love it if you could just give my listeners kind of an introduction of who you are and how you got introduced to the outdoors and hunting? Yeah, that's a difficult question. Um, I, uh, I never really grew up hunting just like you, buddy. I was, uh, came to the States. I have a family that's steeped in hunting heritage. Um, grandfather lived the heyday of African hunting. My, my dad was a camp boy in the heyday of Africa. Uh, I got nothing. I got stories. I got trophies on the wall. Uh, but when I came to Mississippi in 2003, I got thrust into you know, re- essentially redneck central of what hunting <laughs> was and given a lawn chair and given a gun and said, if something walks by, shoot it. <laughs> um, and so unfortunately, that, you know, I, 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 I almost said unfortunately, but fortunately that was my beginnings. And, um, you know, given the project and, and having two young boys now and really trying to understand why we hunt and what hunting means to me and what it means to my boys and what it means to our community. I've started exploring more about that thing that's essentially in our blood and the thing that's in your blood that you've, that you've, you've awakened essentially. So that's, you know, a very quick background. Essentially I'm a pavement special born and raised in South Africa. Mom's Australian, dad's German. Um, Most of my family lives in Australia right now. I've got an aunt left in, in, a, in South Africa and I live in Mississippi and I don't see myself leaving Mississippi. Uh, love it. Love the diversity, love the outdoor lifestyle and the slowness of, of the place that I live. So never going to be in a big city ever again. I love my <laughs> 11,000 people town and that's about it. Oh, I definitely feel you on that. I, uh, I lived in Los Angeles for a long, long time. Uh, right in the center of Hollywood, as a matter of fact, for quite a while. And I'm not sure there is anything on this earth that could possibly get me to move back there after, uh, after finally getting out. So you uh, moved to Mississippi, got introduced to this uh, redneck, uh, <laughs> right. redneck sitting in a lawn chair hunting. Yep. What takes you from there to to starting starting this blood origins project maybe give us first give us kind of a a brief uh, overview of what this project is and then sure. kind of what inspired you to start it how you got there so blood origins simply is a storytelling documentary project about the heart of hunting 
that's it. Uh, we portray people's why to why they hunt. And we, we just were storytellers. Uh, that's as simple as I can put it. Um, the reason why I started the Blood Origins project was Again, I had evolved very quickly from 25 to, I think we started this project, you know, four years ago, we we're probably speaking about this project or talking internally with my wife about six years ago. So I was mid thirties, um, I had two boys. I wanted the boys to be hunters. And I really started thinking about like, you know, what does hunting mean to me? Because I need to explain to my boys, you know, this idea of hunting. And so I started exploring more deeply internally about what hunting meant to me. I started rereading my grandfather's books, uh, my grandfather's stories. And I just started thinking, okay, well, where are my boys going to get inspiration for hunting from? One, me. And two, essentially the digital content space that we live in daily. And so I started looking at social media and I started looking at the outdoor channel and sportsman's channel and I just wasn't enamored by what I was seeing. I was seeing a lot of fakeness. I was seeing a lot of uh, lack of authentic authenticity and there was something missing. It was like, why is nobody talking about why they hunt? You know, it's, it was almost like we had forgotten how to be storytellers. Um, and it was, you know, it, it's a facet of the outdoor community or the outdoor industry, unfortunately, right now that it was all geared around the kill, right? And that's what sells products. And it's a business, I get it. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not playing down that. I'm not playing down is the wrong term. I'm not bashing that. It's just an artifact of the business. And the why, the purpose, the reason why we do things isn't, doesn't sell bullets and doesn't sell guns and doesn't sell scopes. It, uh, it just, it, what it does, and here's the, here's the paradigm. What it does is it keeps hunters hunting. It allows our lifestyle to continue. It brings new people into the fold like yourself. And if you think about it a little deeper than just selling a gun, that's the ideal marketing strategy for any outdoor company to increase its community and client base. But if you're not targeting the why and you're just targeting the kill, then the community is slowly going to taper off and the client and, and our community just starts spiraling and you throw in conservation and conservation dollars in the Pittman Robertson Act. And you want to be a conspiracy theorist, it just starts breaking apart. And well, it's not even a conspiracy theory, it's just truth. Um, it starts breaking apart and all of a sudden, hmm, who's paying for wildlife? Who's paying for the conservation? What happened to hunting? What happened to the hunting community? And so I say that all to say, that's why I started Blood Origins. Um, I was fortunate to be on a podcast with a good friend of yours, uh, Ryan Mickler. And he asked me a very unique question that I've never been asked before, which was, why did you throw your hat in the arena? Which is essentially the question you asked me. Um, and my answer was, and it still is they, I couldn't see a project that wasn't about self. Yeah. You're talking to me, Robbie Kroger. And yes, I built blood origins, but you won't see Robbie Kroger on blood origins. You'll know my, you'll know my voice, but it's all about us. It's about you. It's about our community. And that is the most important part of the project and of, of, of us. Sorry, I was just I was sitting there for a second. I was just listening and enjoying, and you have this way about you that just draws people <laughs> in um, that makes them forget they're hosting a podcast for a minute. Um, I appreciate that. Well, you know, and as, as we were talking earlier, um, I, I have to admit, and I'll admit here on air, that I am incredibly jealous of your ability to one draw people in but then two with the people you're talking with pull out um those tidbits and those stories and kind of get beyond that very uh that facade that kind of very top level stuff and really draw out uh the core of 
someone's why. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I, I really hate using the term the why because uh, I feel like it gets overused <laughs> sometimes in these conversations, but yeah. Yeah. It, it's the only way without spending a half an hour defining the phrase to actually say right. it. But um, yeah, my cameraman and I, we mm-hmm. talk about peeling the onion layer, right? Or finding mm-hmm. the gold. We talk about finding the gold and my cameraman know when I get it because it's just, they'll look at me and I'm like, you get it that? And he was like, oh yes, I got that. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you a little secret and it's not, it's, it's probably nothing you've not heard before, but I, I, what I've found is with interviewers, they tend to, they tend to have a list of questions that they want to get through and they have to get through. And that's what they're going to get out of somebody. And when you have a list of questions, you're not going to get what you want. You're going to get what you ask. That's important to listen, right? You're not going to get what you want. You're going to get what you ask. And so the easiest way that I can describe why we get what we get is because I listen. That's it. I've built up, when we talk to all of our stories and and when we get to a point where we're talking to someone, we never hit somebody cold. If we hit somebody cold, it takes a little while to really get the goal and to really, you know, layer that onions. Um, to peel that onion layer back. But so what I've, what I typically do is for about three weeks, I'm throwing seeds, I'm planting seeds constantly into their heads. And a lot of the times I'm sending very stock standard questions. Who brought you into hunting? Um, You know, what does the phrase hunting is conservation mean to you? All these typical stuff that you would ask somebody, but I never ask any of those questions when I hit the ground. All I've done is for weeks, I've just been planting seeds and I've been germinating seeds and I've been watering those seeds with just constant peppering, constant peppering, constant peppering. And when we get to them, uh, we've slowed down a little bit. I used to run and gun and I used to put a lot of, uh, we would go for a weekend and I'd record four stories. Um, Now I try to record one story a weekend. That way I can spend more time with them and develop relationships. But more often than not, they're ready. Some are in different states of readiness. <laughs> and I've typically thought out exactly my, my first question or my first phrase, or I've heard something back from them on the email that I filed away that I want to steer them. And then after that, it's really a listening exercise. And I, I poke at things that I heard and I will steer them without them knowing that I'm steering them, I'll steer them in a direction that I want them to go. And more often than not, it turns into a conversation because they'll finish speaking and I'll, and I'll just stand, you know, I, I typically tell them, I said, you're a hunter. Or sometimes if you're a bow hunter, I typically use this analogy. I said, you're a bow hunter. You're used to discomfort. Hmm. I said, so I'm going to put you in an uncomfortable situation right now. And I want you to just sit there and we're not going to say anything. We're going to wait for you. And feel uncomfortable. I want you to feel uncomfortable because then they start like, you know, they get a little antsy and they have to get the stuff off their chest. And once they got the stuff off their chest, then they start talking. And that's when the gold comes. So all I would say is listen, because once you listen and you hear what you want to, then, you know, you're hearing what you want versus getting what you ask. And I think uh, that's one of, that's one of the things I've, to some extent tried to do. I may not have have had it quite that well defined, but uh I've just with my podcast, I've always hoped that uh they just continue to be conversations. Sure. It can go where it needs to go and it's never just me with my list trying to go trying to go down the a certain amount of bullet points and and things like that. And I've had I've had some amazing conversations that both of us by the end of it are uh we'll kind of, we'll kind of stop and we'll be like, where on earth did that come from? You know? And uh, <laughs> for sure, man. I think those end up being the best ones just because like you said, you get those tidbits that you would have never even thought to ask, or you would have never known mm-hmm. to ask otherwise. If you, like you, like you said, if you hadn't been listening, but yeah, storytelling is an art, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, I wasn't, I'm not a cinematographer. I'm not a, I'm not a creative director. I'm a scientist. That's my day job. Uh, you know, I do science for a living and but there's an inherent art, I, I guess, to science. And it's, 
there's a creative side to to me and this blood origins is my is my outlet essentially for that creativity and i just have an idea of what i want it to look like and i use the best cameraman that i can find young guns that are sort of taught through google university and uh, man there's some good young talent out there i'm telling you what really good talent so you have had a pretty big variety of guests yeah. on the on the show and even just before this i was kind of scanning through some of the names and um it's you know it's uh yeah you look at some of them and you're like wow some of some of these names like i mean even if you're not in hunting i guarantee you've heard of these names you know guys like jim shockey and um but then a lot of these other other folks unless you're really you know really vested in uh in this world of hunting or especially sometimes african hunting or whatever it may be you may not have ever ever heard of of some of these folks um how do you how do you go about finding finding people that you would like to feature on the in the project <laughs> yeah that's a it's a typically golden question i always get it they're like how did you find that person or like how how does this work and so uh, how it worked in the beginning was we were just desperate so <laughs> if, if people were like can can we tell your story they're like yep all right you're in um luckily we you know we when i first started i did a pilot with a guy called lake pickle and lake pickle is a videographer for primos hunting uh, Lake was in my ecology class. That's how I got to know Lake. He was, I, was his prof I was his professor. He was a student of mine. And so I knew he was in this world. I had met Will Primos, uh, but I knew that Lake will worked for Will Primos. And so I said, Let's, I want to do this project. Lake thought it was great timing. We built three pilots. I then put it in front of Will Primos. Lake offered me the opportunity to put it in front of Will Primos. And I knew I had it when Will didn't even ask about the art. He just turned to me and says, do you own it? And I said, what do you mean, do I own it? I said, I've got the federal trademarks. And I said, ah. He says, is there anyone else in that space? And what people don't realize is that the project was actually called something else before Blood Origins. It was called In the Blood. And there were two projects that had In the Blood in the name. And he said, pivot right now because you're going to have such emotional uh, attachment to that that that." to your baby and then somebody's going to challenge you or somebody's going to do something stupid within the blood and it's going to be associated with you. So I said, okay. And so we thought really long and hard about how we're going to change the name and we changed it to blood origins and it just fits much better actually. Um, and right then at the time when I showed Will Primos, it was the Jim Shockey was coming to the Mississippi wildlife extravaganza on behalf of Primos. And I said to Will, I said, can I get in front of Jim? He goes, you want to film Jim? I said, no, no, I just want to plant a seed in Jim Shockey's brain. And so I was pinching myself. I had dinner at Will Primos' house with Jim Shockey and Will Primos. I laid everything out in front of Jim Shockey. I showed him the content. I knew I had something when he turned to me and he goes, how are you going to push this out? Or he actually asked me, how did you film this? Because we had like five different angles constantly. And I said, well, we had two cameras and, mm -hmm. you know, don't want to give too much away of our secrets of redneck <laughs> ingenuity. But, um, and uh, he said, yeah, I'm in. Just let me know how I can help you. And thank, you know, thank the Lord for Jim Shockey because like a month later, I emailed him. Well, first, a funny story. I drove home that night and I called the guy who started me hunting. A guy called Landon, the big six foot five redneck, 260 pound. I said, you won't believe it, but I have Jim Shockey's cell phone number in my cell phone. <laughs> he was like, what? And I said, yep. And I explained it all. And he was over the moon. And so a month later, I emailed Jim and I said, I'm ready. Let's come up to you. We'll film you. We're ready. And Jim was like, nope, time out. He said, show me a distribution strategy. I, I read his email. I went to Google and I said, what is a distribution <laughs> strategy? And it was like uh, that he made me, he made me slow down. He made me slow down and think of like, how are we going to get this out to people and how are we going to do this? Uh, it took a year to get to Jim, 
once we started talking and once we had the distribution strategy and the statistics and and uh, we, we showed him what we did and he said, okay, that's impressive. Here's my team. My team will set it up. See you in Vancouver Island. And um, that's how it started. And now, and so what I, I call those original episodes originators. So today we still will look for originators. We'll still look for that, that one story that's just like, whoa. Or you'll follow somebody on Instagram and you're just like, I just have to have that story, right? The, the way that they project the message, the way that they, um, everything about that person, you're like, okay, I want to, I want to just reach out and say, Hey, this is who I am. Would you be interested? And we do that a lot. But now if you look at our logo, our logo says blood in the shape of a bullet. It's got a DNA helix in the middle of the, of the O and it's got a family tree that comes out of the DNA helix. That family tree is supposed to represent my grandfather to my father to me to my boys but what it's turned into is the blood origins family tree so you have an originator which is in the logo and then now the way that it works is that every story essentially becomes a part of my family becomes a part of our family becomes invested in what we're doing and so the last thing we want to happen is for a us to tell a story where we've missed the mark in terms of perception, right? Somebody's done something, you didn't pick it up, you pushed the, the episode out and they're like, you did an episode on that guy? You just lost all credibility. Mm -hmm. So the way that we get around that is the guys that are now, that we filmed, they tell me who I'm going off to next. And I don't care who it is. It doesn't have to be known. I don't care if it's unknown. You tell me who's next. And so now we're on the second to third, and even this spring, we're going to be on the fourth node of the family tree. And so it's pretty cool the way that it's now. And then you've got people who know each other across the nodes. And so one day, I hope the, if, if any of your listeners are a super creative art design person, I'd love to have this ability to create these these trees that have these nodes that come out. I, what, I, what my brain is seeing is obviously a line with nodes that are the originators and then their nodes go up and there'll be crossovers between trees. Mm -hmm. That'd be freaking cool to see. I'm um, definitely uh, picturing that right now with uh, suddenly, you know, as one more gets added and all of a sudden six or seven lines start connecting and, and all of that. It's, I can definitely picture that. So yeah, that's, that's how it works right now. The, um, that's how the, the storytelling works. The episodes that we pick up work. Um, we've got a bunch in the library. So right now I'm on a little mission right now that I'm dropping a different snippet of a different individual every day for 30 days. Um, so everybody's like, cheapest creepers. Who has this guy not interviewed yet? And they're really, you know, they're hard hitting. Like the one that we dropped today was, uh, uh, she's going to be a phenomenal episode. Her name's Anna V, Anna Van Ostrand. She's a upland bird hunter in North Georgia. She's a mom of two kids. You know, she's late adult, not late adult. She's just a, she's not a, a, a 20 something year old huntress. She's a mom and she has very firm ethics and beliefs and, and what, she, what she wants to be seen as in the outdoor industry. And, um, the way that I started her episode was I asked her if she was a huntress <laughs> and she was like, uh, please don't ask me that question. I said, she goes, no, she said, skip. <laughs> then she said, please don't ask me that question. And I said, this is not a skip question. And then that's the snippet today. Yeah. And so, yeah. um, yeah, so it's, we're just privileged. I'm humbled every time I'm in front of somebody because they're pouring their heart out to me and I get, I get entrusted with the ability to tell their story and um yeah super humbling i uh yeah i've been watching uh i've been watching all those snippets uh coming out and it's been getting me getting me really really excited to to see these stories come to life uh you interviewed a, another good friend of mine uh jess byers she's oh, uh, i've had yes. her on the podcast a couple of times 
I absolutely, Jess and Braxton are two of my absolute favorite people on this world. Uh, and I'm, so I'm super excited when, uh, when I saw her popping up on y'all's feed, I did a, I, I did a little, I may have done a little cheer <laughs> when I, when I saw that one. Uh, yeah. So Jess is going to be the end, the bookend of this season. Nobody knows that yet. So now everyone knows it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we're going to drop Jess as the final episode of season four. So we literally have, uh, we dropped an episode yesterday. So that was January 29th, Ramsey Russell. And uh, we've caused a bunch of tears across <laughs> the world with Ramsey's episode. It was just, when the guy starts out, an ep, uh, even the, it actually started the interview, the way that he, the, the episode starts when he says that, you know, kids don't spell uh, love D O V E or D U C K. They spell it T I M E. And I'm telling you, I've had so many people reach out and go, man, that just hit me in the feels. So we've got, we've just dropped Ramsey. And then at the end of middle of February, February 21st, we're going to release our journey for our season four. Our journeys are typically a much larger story. Um, Sometimes in the hunt space, sometimes not. The February journey is in the hunt space, and, and I'll, we can get into some details here shortly. Then I'm going to drop two non-hunter perspectives after the journey, which are non-hunters expressing their perspectives on hunting. And then the final episode of the season will be Jess Byers. <laughs> and it's strong. Uh, it's like it's going to punch people right in the freaking gut. Oh, I, uh, I. I know a lot about Jess's story and uh, I can, I can only imagine. I'm really, really looking forward to seeing all of that, but then especially, uh, especially that book and uh, with her. Well, it's emotional and it's strength. This is, that's okay. the, what I love about it. It's got emotion and it's got her like fighting that emotion, trying to be strong at the same time. It's, it's pretty good. Yep. So with, Adding all of these stories to the the Blood Origins family tree, you know, you're you're taking in uh, stories from people all over the world, all over the hunting spectrum, all over the race and age and this, that, and the other, and you know, you're getting in there with them, like you know, you're you're right in the middle of it. How has from the start of this project to the end, how has your perspective on hunting evolved or changed how is how is how have all these stories affected you you know each story affects us differently um you know we get the privilege of standing behind a camera when somebody's pouring their heart out to us um you know joey goshe in yazoo in panther swamp stood next to the tree that he gave his life over to christ on and expressed to us the way that he loves Christ and the way that he loves outdoors is like seeing his daughter pinned up to a cross and screaming to him, why daddy, why? And him streaming tears and you're behind the camera going, holy smokes, what is going on here? Um, you know, cause Strickland talking about giving time, you know, talking about how valuable time is. It's our most valuable commodity. And that's what something he just wants to give. Um, you know, you hear people that unfortunately are getting bashed in the hunting industry for being a hunter. And, you know, you can't feel, but like, she's we're just destroying ourselves um, to people that are, you know, using hunting as a means to heal themselves, right? Jeremy Austin, double-legged amputee, and the boy does more, did, you know, 17 miles in two days next to me in a sloppy Georgia mud. And you look at him, actually, I woke up in the same uh, hotel room and I looked over and there is two legs just standing next to the bed ready to be used. And I'm just like, holy smokes. It's just, you know, it's a privilege. It's a, it's a humbling honor. And uh, your question was, how has our perspective on hunting changed? I, I don't think our perspective on hunting has I don't think it's changed. I think it has, um, it has expanded and expanding to the width and the breadth of what hunting means to people. And so that's, you know, really where we're, we're living right now. We're living in this wide tunnel 
and that's our heart and that's the heart of hunting and i feel like we've captured the heart of hunting i don't believe anyone else and and i'll make i want to be very clear about the fact that i am going to be super supportive of anybody who gets into the storytelling space yeah we have a very unique look about us we have a very unique way about how we do things and uh what's the what's the phrase imitation is the greatest form of flattery and people are going to start doing what we do and that's okay because it's as long as they're telling good stories and as long as they're doing it for the right reasons i'm going to be completely for it i'm none of this turf crap that you know we typically get into um there's a project in canada right now called one campfire i learned about them like two weeks ago three weeks ago love to see if we could collaborate you know to see where those synergies are they're doing the same thing they're just they're talking to normal blue collared folks about why hunting is so important to them and i think the more that that message can get out there the more of that non 200 million or 100 million american block can understand and see positive things around hunting the more likely hunting lifestyle is going to be around for my kids and my grandkids one day so speaking to the non hunting community um i think blood origins has is a fantastic tool that can be used to reach out to the non-hunting community um, because it focuses n- so uh, not on the kill, but like, as we keep saying, the why, um, you know, somebody's somebody scrolling through uh, scrolling through Amazon prime and they come across it. It's a, it's really a fantastic Avenue to reach out to the non-hunting community. Um, if you could, distill your message to a non hunter and really to get, to get across to them. If you could distill that message, you know, into a, into a short, short pitch, what would, what would that be to the non for the non hunter? So you're going to hear it for the first time that I'm hearing it, right? Cause I'm going to brain fart it out. All right. Sounds good to me. I would say that life is about purpose. And in, in, in that purpose is fulfilled with several different endeavors. Hunting is a purpose. Hunting allows people to go to places, to see things, to do things, to make relationships, and to invest in conservation because that's what the purpose of hunting is. It's like going to Mount Everest because you're a climber, right? You go to Everest to climb. And we go to places to hunt. And that hunting, the the kill component of that hunting is just a mere fraction of what the purpose of why we go there uh, essentially is for, right? Because there's so many times that hunting in America, internationally, wherever you are, you do not kill an animal, but you still hunted. You still went, you still went for that purpose. And yes, the un. I'm going to use unfortunate because this we're talking to a non-hunter. The, the, the outcome of a hunt is to kill something. And that is something that is difficult to wrap your mind around that, you know, we're killing something. But at the end of the day, if you, if that didn't happen, that, that intersection between life and death didn't happen, then the purpose is not there anymore. And if that purpose is not there, then there's a whole system of conservation that disappears that a lot of people don't really understand. And so to me, hunting to, you know, the, the, why we hunt is, is, it's, it's complicated. It, it ranges the gamut from legitimately from people providing food for themselves to an ancient contract that we feel is still primal inside of us. And it's a it's a it's 180 degrees, and everyone fits along that timeline to why they hunt. The kill is is the anticlimax, essentially. Sorry, that was a bit of a brain fart. No, that was perfect. That was absolutely perfect. So, say somebody came up to you and said, uh, you know, maybe you run into them at an expo or at the grocery store. Who knows? Uh, you know, they've seen maybe seen a few episodes of blood origins, or maybe they just know you're a hunter and, you know, they say to you, you know, I've, 
I really feel like this is something, you know, to make the pun in my blood. Um, I really feel like this is something I want to do, but I have no background in it. I have no history in it. I'm not mm. even, I don't even know any other hunters. Um, yeah. There's so much to learn. This is way too intimidating for me. What would you say to that person? Um, how would you either encourage them or what words of wisdom would you give them? Yeah. So if I was in the, pos- if I was in the position to take them, I would. And um, I actually just posted a photograph today of a guy out of Nashville that we took hunting for the first time and he killed something for the first time. Incredible, incredible. incredible. So that would be number one. If I could, I would. But if I can't, then I would suggest a number of resources. I would say, obviously, Google University is the best place (laughs) to do whatever you want to learn about hunting. Um, But there's other things like Go Wild app. Uh, the Go Wild app is a great app for meeting new hunters, for just a community. Um, I would say that there is a community called Powder Hook. Uh, a guy called Eric Dinger runs Powder Hook. Powder Hook's all about connecting hunters to non hunters. So if you start really digging, and then obviously you've got backcountry hunters and anglers, you've got all these different organizations that you can just plug into if you're if you're truly interested. Uh, I will say this, there's probably that individual that's coming up to you is either going to do one of two things. He's either going to go, I want to learn by myself and go by myself, or I want to be with someone and I want to become a part of a community and I'm going to go as a community. And so the organization route is probably the the community route, the Google university, uh, trying it out for myself, DIY route. And that's probably your route. I assuming right now. Uh, Yeah. So though sometimes I wish I had started in a uh, in a wiser manner, but <laughs> why? Why? Oh, I love because of trial and error. I love I love what I do, uh, but I wish I had uh, I wish I had also reached out a little bit more and uh, and uh, taken the initiative to ask ask some folks to take me on a few hunts before I decided to start chasing elk with my bow in the back country, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, uh, I think it's each to his own. Each one, each person's going to have a different route into hunting. Um, there's, there's so m- you know, from 10 years ago to today, there's so many more resources available that it, it's a matter of, you know, honestly, if you just reached into a, an online forum and say, I'm a first time hunter, would love to experience this. I guarantee you would get like invites out the wazoo essentially. All right. So if folks want to find blood origins, where can they watch? Well, number one, it's not blood oranges. Okay. Blood oranges. You didn't say oranges. You didn't say oranges. (laughs) I was going to say, give me a break. I got the, I've still got the shot show (laughs) flu here. And so that you didn't say it. You didn't say it. Um, but a bunch of people like I've, uh, I keep using the analogy because it keeps coming to me. I keep getting sent IPA beers that are made from blood origin. They're like, Oh, I couldn't believe you had the beer. And oh I was like, my nah, gosh. Orange, orange. But, um, oh, type in blood me. origin into any social media platform. We're not on Twitter. Well, we are on Twitter, but I don't post on Twitter. Um, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Amazon Prime, Waypoint TV, Mossio Go, when we don't have a camera-related episode. Um, yeah, you can find us anywhere. Just Blood Origin us into Google, and uh, my team's done a pretty good job of SEOing us. So <laughs> we'll take up the first two pages. <laughs> well, I will make sure to link to those on the show notes page. Uh, that'll be at the wildinitiative.com. Robbie, I really appreciate you taking the time, sit down with me, share about the Blood Origins project. Um, I am really looking forward to seeing everything that's coming out this season. Any final thoughts before we log off? Yeah, I will give you one final thought. And that's what I promised I would tell you, which is the film that's dropping February 21st is Ooh, a that's right. That's right. Buffalo hunt in, in Australia where the whole intent of the film was to essentially rediscover what was in my blood. Um, My mom's Australian. I walked in a place that probably no white man has ever walked. We found Aboriginal paintings that probably no white man has ever seen. 
And the whole point of the film was to really figure out the texture of the Aboriginal landscape. And naturally, because we were there to hunt, you know, find the oldest, maturest bull that we could find and do it in a way that my grandfather would have hunted a buffalo in Mozambique, which is 416 Rigby, open sights, oh. get bow range. Um, and so when you see the film, the film, you are going to feel in every aspect of, of, of your senses, sight, sound, touch, taste, we try to convey taste through, and uh, hearing you being in the landscape with me and all authentic as you typically would expect from Blood Origins. It's badass. Oh, man. It is badass. I cannot wait to see this. I absolutely cannot wait to see this. Well, y'all, make sure you keep an eye out for that on the 21st, you said? Yep, 21st of February. On the 21st of February. Well, Robbie, thanks again so much for uh, joining me today. Thank you, Sam. Much, much appreciated. All right, y'all, that'll do it for this episode of The Wild Initiative. Make sure you check out the show notes page at thewildinitiative.com. That'll do it for this week, but until next time, I hope this episode inspired you to get involved, get outdoors, and plan your initiative for the wild. Thank you for listening to The Wild Initiative. Please take a moment to leave a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher and head on over to thewildinitiative.com to get show notes, check out the blog, gear discounts, other podcasts from the Wild Initiative family, and more.